Everybody ready? Um, before I introduce tonight's guest, I've been asked to remind everyone um, about tomorrow night's lecture. It seems our uh, Monday night lecture series is becoming a Monday and sometimes Tuesday and once in a while Wednesday night lecture series, which uh, as far as I'm concerned is great, the more the merrier. Um, tomorrow at 7 o'clock, Steve Eisenhower from Robert Venturi's office will be back uh, for the sequel to his January lecture. He'll be talking about uh, current museum projects from the office, um, and he's been generous enough to come back for free, so you won't have to pay to get in like you usually do. Um, I know this is a pretty busy week for everybody, but I'd like to encourage you all to attend his lecture as well, and thanks for coming out tonight. Um, tonight, it's a pleasure to be able to introduce you all to Wes Jones. Wes is a principal and the director of design for Holt Hinshaw Fraud Jones in San Francisco, one of the best known and widely publicized young design firms on the West Coast. Since 1987, the firm has won PA awards for six of their projects, Wes? Close enough? <laughs> um, including the winning competition entry for the Astronauts Memorial at the Kennedy Space Center, uh, which I hope Wes will be talking about as part of his lecture tonight. He holds a Master of Architecture degree from Harvard. He did his undergraduate work at Berkeley and West Point. Um, before moving to San Francisco and joining Holt Hinshaw and Fa, uh, he worked for Peter Eisman at Eisman Robertson and Architects in New York as a project designer on the Wexner Center at Ohio State. He was a recipient of the Rome Prize in Architecture as well as numerous other distinguished design awards. Um, this semester, Wes is teaching a design studio at Columbia, so he's, he's pulling this every other week, fly back and forth across the country. Um, lifestyle these days, and we were lucky enough to convince him to um, jump out of the plane today uh, in one of his cross-country flights to stop briefly in Muncie to speak to us tonight. So, without further delay, please give a warm welcome to Wes Jones. I know you know it's a tricky part. <laughs> Can you hear me? Um, again, I'd like to thank you all for showing up. I understand you're all on charrette, and uh, I'll try to make it worthwhile. For those of you who do have to get back to the studio, this should last about 55 minutes. And I'd like to encourage questions afterward, but again, if you guys are busy, I'll, I'll understand. So I guess uh, if we can have the uh, lights, we'll start. Do I do lights? Okay, great. Oh, I've already started to screw it up. Uh, <laughs> just a little preview. Okay, now, okay. Architects like to think in terms as big as the stuff they make. And by big, I mean basic. They're conditioned to this by the sheer scale of the architectural endeavor and by the fuzziness of understanding what exactly or actually architecture is. They assign on purely intuitive, practical grounds and importance to the architectural endeavor. Then they try to justify this importance. That is, they try to make an understanding of architecture which lives up to these expectations. If building is so big, if it represents so great an investment, if it is to quite literally make up our whole environment, we will call it architecture. In order to understand architecture as an idea beyond the common notion that it is merely a superlative of building, we can also consider it in this way. We can see it as a frame we place around certain experiences, buildings or otherwise, which says that these are architecture. This is a reading orientation. It sees architecture as an overlay onto an otherwise pre-existing condition in order to render that condition meaningful. It frames that condition as the intentional environment. It creates the expectations we feel in the presence of those conditions selected by the frame that they have meaning, 
that they are capable of, that they even desire, being read, being given attention, or being engaged. But when it comes to characterizing what this environment is, the frame does not say so much what is inside as what is outside. These architectural experiences, the frame delimits, are characterized on the one hand relative to building, but is more so. On the other hand, they're related to art, but is less so. This gives us function and utility versus art and expression. But from each extreme, architecture itself is banished. It is too much an art to be mere building, yet it is constrained by too much function to be pure art. So, strangely enough, for so apparently emphatic a presence, architecture occupies the fuzzy zone in the middle. Architects have historically tried to combat this definitive but embarrassing fuzziness by seeking a source, a starting point, an origin for architecture that would isolate meaning, that would found their practices on something more solid than just good intentions. From such a starting point, it seems like it would be an easy matter to trace the evolution of the discipline and thus pin down architecture's real, precise nature, to root its apparent presence in an equally satisfying explanation. Yet each act of discovery has ultimately turned out instead to be an invention. What is revealed is not a true ancestor, innocent of its own future, but an expedient and suspiciously exact confirmation of the discoverer's own beliefs. The most well-known example of this is contained in An Essay in Architecture by the Abbé Loger, written in 1752. Roger tries to deduce some, quote, first principles from the evidence in the classicism of his time, and then to turn around and discover in these principles the authority which blesses that very classicism. This tautology was reinforced by two mutually exclusive goals. To demonstrate classicism was an absolutely natural phenomenon, and to give a complete picture of architecture based on extrapolation from these naturally deduced first principles. It is the same in architecture as in all other arts, he says. Its principles are founded on simple nature, and nature's process clearly indicates its rules. Let us look at man in his primitive state without any aid or guidance other than his natural instincts. He is in need of a place to rest. On the banks of a quietly flowing brook, he notices a stretch of grass. He is drawn there and stretches out at leisure on this sparkling carpet. But soon the scorching heat of the sun forces him to look for a shelter. A nearby forest draws him to its cooling shade. He runs to find a refuge in its depth, and there he is content. But suddenly mists are rising, swirling around and growing denser, until thick clouds cover the skies. Soon torrential rain pours down on this delightful forest. The savage does not know how to protect himself from the uncomfortable damp that penetrates everywhere. He creeps into a nearby cave and, finding it dry, he praises himself for his discovery. But soon the darkness and foul air surrounding him make him his stay unbearable again. He leaves in his resolve to make good by his ingenuity the careless neglect of nature. Some fallen branches in the forest are right material for his purposes. He chooses four of the strongest, raises them upright, and arranges them in a square. Across their top, he lays four other branches. On these, he hoists from two sides yet another row of branches, which, inclining toward each other, meet at their highest point. He then covers this kind of roof with leaves so closely packed that neither sun nor rain can penetrate. Thus, man is housed. Such is the course of simple nature, he concludes. By imitating the natural process, art was born. All the splendors of architecture ever conceived have been modeled on the little rustic hut he has just described, he claims. Undeniably, architecture is dependent for its heritage on a reference to nature. This heritage might be said to have begun with the glorification of the primitive hut in stone. Yet, as undeniably, this glorification was of the hut, emphatically described by Loger himself, 
as an articulated assemblage of discrete parts. His was a description of the hut as a machine, not as an embodiment of nature. This hut was a machine for distinguishing man, distancing him by his ingenuity from this nature, rather than linking him to it. Leger's discovery, like all the others, was also an attempt to turn architecture into an axiomatically closed system. That is to say, to make it a complete and completely understood and therefore limited system. Such a system depends for its insights on extrapolation or evolution from a definite beginning point. This is its axiom. An axiom is defined to be accepted as true as the basis for inference. This truth cannot be established by reference to external authority. It must be self-evident. Yet each discovery or invention of this axiom by succeeding generations of architects is, at the moment of creation, of invention, a critical act, since it admits the same outside perspective which the system itself must deny if it is to remain complete, if it is to be the only system. And of course, the circle continues since the system can only claim this by pointing to the certainty, the finality of its origin or axiom. And so the mystery is preserved with each discovery that attempts to dispel it, and the door always remains open to contributions. Since form is not exhausted in function, since there is always a distance between form and function called expression, architects are continuously led to ask the central question, what does architecture express? As we mentioned earlier, architecture is big. So in looking for meaning, it goes straight for the big stuff, the basics. This usually means reality, God, the absolute, the forms, ideality, or certainty, or some variation of these. Yet, when you think about it, you realize that even these are only predictions and goals. They do not describe the real ground against which we figure our lives. The real ground, the most basic, ultimate, supreme, totally radical ground of all these efforts, is simply the effort itself. It is the fact of intentionality. The others, certainty, the absolute, God, are just figures of extremity or matters of degree. And even their opposites so celebrated today, uncertainty, error, or weakness, are other names for the same, positions against the ground of intention. Communicated intention is the basis of all public and private difference from the condition degree zero. Intention, function, machine. It is our belief that only an expanded understanding of the machine can find and fix this ground in expression. And not just as the means, though also as such, but as the referent itself. Not what is asked, but the asking itself. Not the referent even, but the referring. This is what sets humans apart, not the knowledge of God, but the desire which intends him, and thus not the awareness of his absence, but the horror vacui which follows this awareness and intends to rectify it. Man stands today on the twin thresholds of the stars and of destruction. It is intention, it is technology, it is the machine that has brought us to this position. Here it stands beside us as a companion in its capacity for service. Here it also crouches behind us, pushing us closer to the brink of catastrophe. We cannot back away, however. We are too dependent. We can only ensure that as we step through the, uh, the door that it is the correct door, and that we can only do this by admitting this dependence.
by realizing that we are not going through the door alone. This means finally coming to grips with the machine, making sure that our relationship with it is such that it can become, if not remain, our companion in the hopefully continuing adventure. This choice of thresholds is framed by a larger context of scientific understanding. Science is how we see nature, how nature is made present to us today when we seek to know her. And in this, it is perhaps also how we enframe her. Despite even this latter possibility, nature is the ultimate context and final means for judging our abilities, and in some sense, our worth. Nature will forever remain truly outside our grasp. It is the only and all-encompassing externality. It is the closest thing to an absolute that we can confront. Technology, the machine, is the bridge we extend to this all-encompassing externality. Technology is science which participates in the external world. By so interacting with it, it makes that world at the far end of the bridge visible. And at its other end, this bridge also makes visible the working of our internal world. Because technology, the machine, is the manifestation of the way we think. It is the means by which we extend this thought, by which we extend ourselves into this exterior world. This extension of ourselves is an exercise of will, a physicalizing of intention. When we set intention into the world, we call it function and so bestow on the machine which results its own will. Because the machine bridges between us and the outside world, between ourselves and nature or reality, we are only one of its parents and so we cannot command complete obeisance. We give it this will by intending that it serve us. This patrimony is necessary to the definition of all machines, to all uh, products of our hands and minds, but it is not sufficient. Once we make them, they are out there, and then must obey other commands, the commands of nature that we understand less well. We lose touch. These machines may then confuse the relationship for which they act as bridge beginning a process that leads, perhaps, to the wrong threshold. So the mechanical, the machine, is an exteriorization of our understanding, a manifestation of our approach to the world. When we make, we make a machine and set it there before ourselves and before the world, in the world, between us, as if to say, thus I represent myself, Thus, I demonstrate my ability. We set this machine into the world and test our understanding of this world. This is the stuff of our abilities. It is, for example, a boat which gives a legible presence to the wind, a visibility to its direction and dynamics, and synthesizes this with the water to give intended motion. So in the machine we see manifested intention, we see logic, we see the propositional form, we see ourselves encapsulated and recreated. Finally, we see meaning placed into the world. And so, through a human act, we are not alone in this world. Now, I say machine in all this instead of technology because at the scale of human empathy for or engagement in the world, reality is and will remain inescapably Newtonian or mechanical. We live in a Newtonian world. Though we can talk about relativity and quantum mechanics, the Big Bang and the quark, we can only experience mechanical relationships. Through our limited senses, we can only appreciate stuff that we can touch, taste, hear, see, or smell. Apparent mechanical laws, like cause and effect, so condition our understanding that it has been a 6,000 year effort to even think beyond the mechanical. These laws are hardwired into our brains by two million years of evolution within what we now call a Newtonian world. 
It might even be argued that those advances beyond mechanical thinking by the Einsteins and Hawkings of the world were not only mechanically bootstrapped into existence, but remain as viable concepts only by reference to mechanical analogy, whether as transcendent of this analogy or as reactive to it. So the particular thresholds we face now were not inevitable, perhaps, but the presence of the machine there with us is. Indeed, even the idea of threshold itself is, of course, rooted in mechanical understanding. And this brings us to architecture again. Architecture is the way we legitimize our view of our position in the world. It is the biggest thing we make, and because of this, an agency through which we grant authority to the accepted view of our place in the order of things. Which is why, in my opinion, postmodern historicism, for example, is such an embarrassment to architects who believe that architecture still bears this responsibility to society. Architecture does this through representation. It represents to us where we are and how we stand in this world. This official representation occurs through reference to external authority, thus endowing itself with this authority. As we saw previously, this authority, this absolute, is, was, and must be nature. But of course it is nature filtered by our understanding. This understanding has varied through history, and so has architecture. The forms of classical architecture, for example, were borrowed from an experiential surface understanding of nature. This gave classicism its natural forms and the pyramidal compositional principle. The abstract forms and dynamic compositional logic of modernism resulted from a more scientific but still idealized view of the forces at play which underlie the surface appearance. Who knows what we'll see in the future? In our work, we're concerned with what is appropriate now. We confront the paradoxes we believe that open today between the inarguable mechanical imperative we've discussed and the dawning appreciation of the place of mystery and undecidability in our pl present pluralistic world. Even if we find ourselves at the threshold of destruction, it is clear to us that the battle for our planet's future will be fought within technology, not against it. Even appropriate technologies or alternative technologies, however respectful, are still scientific engagements of nature, still only different readings of our basic technological contract with nature. Admittedly, technology is at least the proximate cause of our environmental problems. The domineering effects of technology are widely felt. Its attempts to control both man and nature, to subject them to its standards of efficiency and quantification, are well documented and analyzed. Spokestacks which once proclaimed prosperity now seem aimed more menacingly at the sky, like industrial cannons holding the planet hostage. Yet, we must also admit technology's indispensable place in our society and conception of the future. Ultimately, the quarrel should not be with these smokestacks themselves, so much as with the technological mindset that aims them. The attitude which views everything as standing in reserve to be fit into the system and judges quality strictly in quantifiable terms is indeed pervasive in industrial societies. Its universalizing outlook misses both the humane and the natural in its quest for efficiency. The products of this universalizing attitude play an increasingly intrinsic role in our society. But this attitude forces us to cast them as villains, which may make us miss the real culprit. This critique of technology tends to place a distance between us and our machines, which obscures the naturalness of technology as a normal extension of man. Our technology cannot help but bear the personality of its maker. 
This personality is as varied as humanity, and thus not necessarily or uniformly attractive. We are inseparable from our technology. It is the stuff we make. It is what demonstrates and tests the stuff of which we are made. If it is deemed ugly or irresponsible or cruel, it is because we have been ugly, irresponsible, or cruel. The sea change in consciousness that appears to be dawning today describes the magnitude of the changes necessary to affect a true and lasting impact on our relationship with the planet. This change of consciousness must begin with a new heightened awareness and understanding of our relationship to our technology. It is only by this route that any substantive change in technology's relationship to nature may be affected. We interchange humanity and technology freely in assigning the blame for our environmental problems because, despite technology's alienating habits, it is only transparent to the humanity who wields it. The problem is centered precisely here, in the attitude which views technology as something to be wielded, something raised against something else. Whether this something else is truly worth a battle, like poverty or hunger, or is indifferent, like the weather, by wielding technology against it, an attitude is fostered which damns the wider consequences. The us-against-them combative mentality may lead to quick solutions, but seldom to lasting ones. Technology is not a weapon, but a tool and a mirror, and increasingly, inescapably, a companion. Selflessness and sacrifice, however noble, however helpful, are not in themselves solutions, though. The image in this mirror will not go away. We are tied to technology by more than just a selfish regard for the comforts and security it provides. It may seem a cliché to say that man is a machine, but this phrase neatly captures still the limited range of physical experience available to humanity. Technology is a direct expression of how we inhabit and engage the world, a direct outgrowth of our perceptual and cognitive abilities and limitations. And technology is, finally, humanity's own creation. The difference between technology and nature is the difference between man and God. Technology may yearn for the perfection of nature, but like its own creator, it must be satisfied with worship. If architecture expresses our place in this cosmos, then, it, then its formal referent must ultimately be of that world. It must be nature. Technological form is directly expressive of what nature demands or will allow. If architecture retains its traditional role as a vehicle for placing us in the world, then science and technology act as the map. This is an approach which looks through technology to the people who make it, the people who use it and depend on it, and most visibly to the nature which allows it and is made more present in it. This amounts to a spiritualization of technology. Today, the change in consciousness proposed by so many prefigures a new technology of spiritualization, which would once again place technology at the center of our dwelling upon the earth as a visible expression of the relationships that may be fostered there. Because it is so fundamental and perhaps because of this, so expressive, the servant-served relationship has been a prime generator of design schemes in our practice. We have explored in our work various permutations of the basic idea, from, say, the shell served by internal mechanisms and the surface supported by its attendant frame, to natural phenomena served by the expressly artificial. In each case, these are not mere formal exercise, but make use of the meaning behind the basic relationship in order to comment on some issue worthy of architectural attention by assigning value to each of the terms. In our contributions to the Installed Mechanism show held at Columbia University a couple of years ago, for example, 
We use the idea of a shell as a metaphor for society or the epistem. The shell describes the condition of closure that the society or epistem provide as systems or views of the world. We live within the boundaries of this condition, of this enclosure. It provides the comfort of security, of, of certainty. Within an accordingly limited world, we may know everything, and doubt is banished. This describes the ideal role of such a shell, as might have existed during periods of history when, say, for example, the church purported to explain reality. It does not, however, describe the contemporary condition very well. This project, an installation at Columbia, attempts to illustrate the fragmentation of society in the contemporary epistem. It also proposes the machine, via this expression of the servant-served relationship, as a means for healing the wounds caused by such a fragmentation. This is shown literally by the working of each interior mechanism as it intends or attempts to recreate a condition of enclosure, but in its own terms. This proposes that the machine, or a machine-inspired architecture, maintains through its relationship to the most fundamental issues regarding our engagement in the world, maintains the ability to create a local sense of closure about a specific program. It proposes that it creates at this site a local absolute that might serve as an anchor in an increasingly fragmented or fractured world. Wittgenstein despaired for architecture of his age because, as he said, architecture must have something worthwhile to say. But who's really to say what's worthwhile? In a hypocritical age, like we're existing in now, maybe this something could be the project itself, and this project could be theory as well as design. If something has been named and given a purpose, then a context, a world, has been created for the situation of that project. In its own context, within the poverty of greater meaning, this local world may then legislate value and meaning and so fill in its own space within the larger void. The sources for this local value, for this recourse to an intrinsic, if less exalted, worth, are the broadest senses of the words context and program. These uses and places are the only things the project commands, the only things it can lay its hands on with any sense of certainty. This is to suggest that perhaps architecture might lower its sights a little to the apparently less vaunted, but therefore maybe more basic values that might be found in the intention to build, in the institutionalization of that intention in the program as architecture. Just as the individual carries within the fact of his own volition the possibility of the continuance of society, and attains heroism by choosing society over anarchy, so the individual building carries within its own volition, or program, the continuance of architecture, and attains the heroisms that buildings may find by choosing the excess of communication over the silence of simple being or buildingness. The sort of served relationship that such a reading suggests is perhaps even more directly expressed in its surface support frame manifestation, such as shown here in our astronaut's memorial. In this case, the supported surface is a 40 by 50 foot sheet of mirror polished black granite through which the names of the fallen astronauts have been cut. The frame, which supports this granite, also carries a set of mirrors which direct sunlight through the name so that they glow against the sky reflected in the mirror finish of this granite. These photos were taken before the tracking, these are of the model, but the following photos were taken before the tracking um, program was finished for the memorial so that the names don't quite show up as much as they ultimately um, uh, are supposed to. Now, a memorial is mostly a mnemonic device. It must serve two apparently contradictory roles. It must offer itself as a worthy marker, representing in its own presence the importance of those for whom it stands, attracting the attention and the emotions of the visitors who have come to mourn. Yet it must also, finally, not accept this gaze itself, but direct it back inward. It must become transparent 
to the memory of those who fell. In its formal distillation to the simple stating of the names, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial reconciles these roles quite cleanly. In its simplicity and abstraction, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial also succeeds in memorializing for a whole diverse nation the effects of a complex and devastating war. The range of sentiments it must reflect, the numbers of fallen it must acknowledge, and the variety of mourners it must accommodate, the vastness of its audience and the individuality of their grief, all this could only be served by the most exquisite minimalism, the most mute symbolism. The occasion for a memorial is never pleasant. The poignant works will take account of this and not trivialize their role by ignoring a duty to mark this as well. It has been claimed that the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is, at a basic level, a gash in the ground, that it hints at shame as well as pride or grief. In its sheer minimalism, it intends to diffuse this shame and our grief and thus finally to relieve us of it. <laughs> The Astronauts Memorial strives to address these same considerations, but the circumstances of its occasioning, and thus the means of its service, vary substantially from those of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. While it is also a national memorial, the scope of the Astronauts Memorial is much more focused. Though the space program expresses the aspirations of the entire country, and its failures are felt by all of us. It actually involves relatively few of us. While one cannot and should not quantify grief, we can appreciate a difference between 14 names, however valued, and 58,000. Thus, unlike the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, the Astronauts Memorial need not satisfy such a broad range of emotions or attitudes. As a marker, it can be more figural. Though there might be debate about the space program, it is safe to assume that the astronauts memorial would not alienate its audience by insisting on a certain decidability. That decidability advances the memorial's curative role. The same technology which failed the astronauts so disastrously once, our technology, is called upon here to bear them aloft again in memoriam. By burning the astronauts' names into the very sky they gave their lives to explore, this technology, our technology, asks forgiveness and so regains and reaffirms its definitive role in service to humanity. This is a radically different position than that of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. The astronauts' memorial is pretty unambiguously positive in its outlook. It does not question the correctness or value of the astronauts' sacrifice. In its emphatic, figural, decidable presence that seeks not to diffuse our grief, but to focus it, and to unambiguously transform this emotion into a celebration of all that the astronauts flew for. The actual memorial experience, which all this hardware, this presence, only supports, is arguably less opaque than that of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. A memorial must also be transparent to the memories of those who fell. The Vietnam Veterans Memorial achieves this transparency by abstraction, by refusing the eye and mind the easy reward of visual interest. Though it was not our choice for the name of the concept, Space Mirror does describe the literalness by which the Astronauts Memorial achieves its own transparency. As the visitor comes within the restricted feel of the memorial itself, the supporting figure of technology drops away. Like the astronaut sitting astride the apogee of this technology, the visitor is finally confronted with nothing, with the sky itself. I, I think these slides are out of focus. You should be looking at just mirror images of the sky here. Uh, not out of focus, but out of order, I'm sorry. Um, the visitor is finally confronted with nothing but the sky itself, and that in all the glory with which the unique violent atmospherics of Florida can endow it. And this is the memorial, finally. It is no thing at all, but an experience, an experience of the astronauts' field of play and field of honor, upon which their names are etched by the astronomical power of the sun itself. 
The Astronauts Memorial Experience achieves its transparency literally. It mirrors not only our grief, but our aspirations. In a hypercritical age like today, this may seem somewhat reactionary, particularly in relation to the exquisite critique enacted in the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. It is entirely within the nature of the astronauts' quest, for their efforts do constitute a quest in all the best senses of the term, it is entirely within the nature of this quest that their memories contribute to the advance of our understanding. And if this understanding itself is increasingly takes a more critical account of our newly emerging sense of planetary responsibility, we like to think that this space mirror is right there to hold up a looking glass to our progress. Now, the sky reflected in a supported surface may also stand as a poetic example of a servant-served relationship in which nature itself is one of the terms. A more prosaic example can also be seen in a project we did for a lifeguard tower for the beaches of Los Angeles. And in this case, I'll allow the lifeguards themselves to explain. And I guess I'll read this just to time it myself. Um, Actually, let me go back if I... Bob, I've been thinking, if what Heidegger says about technology is true, uh, that it like uh, teases nature into unhiddenness, yeah, if that's true, then it unavoidably places the machine behind all experience as a sort of MacGuffin or frame. MacGuffin, you mean like Hitchcock? Like how? Yeah, kinda, or Derrida. I mean that whenever we see nature, it's because there's a sort of machine behind it somehow, behind the seeing itself, that it sets it all up and like you could use it as a basis for expression. Like the board makes you see the wave? No, but more than the Zen dependence upon definition by antithesis, I'm talking about the fact that the board is a pindale bonzer and not just a log. What do we see that fleshes out the wave with the physical laws to which the bonzer fins and pintail give form. Isn't that just functionalism, dude? Nah, dude, I'm talking expressive excess. Even though the machine's there in the way you think, so you can't escape it anyway, I'm saying maybe you could make it less invisible. Maybe you could tap it as a source for a legitimate, appropriate, deeply powerful and expressive morphology. This is really how the lifeguards talk in LA. I suppose so, Scott, but I bet if you really think about it, you'd realize that its value as a paragon lies in its invisibility. If you could always see it, you would be forever caught in an endless chain of deferral. You mean like seeing the scrim never let you get to the play itself? Totally. And all the mysteries of life that exist in the distance between become trivial. Hmm, I see your point, dude. We'd look pretty silly up here then. And no more babes or waves, just the machines that present them. So let's just keep this between you and me, Broccoli. Totally. And so obviously privileging the servant side of the relationship in our work, we intend to give to the attitude of the whole made up by this servant-served relationship a feeling of the servant relationship. Servant to the viewer, servant to the reader reading. That is, the reading is not merely that of the relationship in the object, not merely of the object as a complete unit, but of the object inflected to the viewer itself as a whole in an attitude of address, of service. <laughs> Since the message is one of service, or at least engagement, this internal relationship becomes a means of amplifying or embroidering as an echo, the primary relationship between the viewer and the object. The hermetic quality of the closed couple is thus defeated not by opening the couple so much as by taking that couple itself as a term in another open relationship. And then the lawn chair is an obvious example of this. Another is our universal display system for the details office products member of the Steelcase Design Partnership. Within the servant served operating concept, we drove this design toward two primary goals. First, 
that the system be very flexible without turning to mush, and second, that it have an engaging personality without becoming cartoonish. Flexibility became the major form determinant. The unit is divided into two major components which serve as the two terms in the servant-served relationship. An articulated support frame and a two-part skin system, itself somewhat adjustable. The skin provides the surfaces for display while the support frame holds the skin in various positions in space. The support frame also carries supplementary lighting, literature, and security measures. Flexibility comes with the working of this frame and the interaction of the frame with the skin. While the skin itself is internally adaptable to different attitudes, the articulating frame can set the skin into any position, taking it all the way from being a wall to a table, from vertical to horizontal display. In addition, any number of skin types may be created. By resisting the apparent usual imperative to systematize everything, we have given the units a much higher degree of flexibility. Basically, anything that can be bolted, clamped, wrapped, glued, tied, or otherwise stuck to the frames can qualify as a skin. The specificity and strength of these frames themselves, coupled with the lack of specificity in their interface requirements, give the units a presence which defeats the usual tendency of flexibility to lead to anonymous mush. The operational simplicity provides a clean datum that encourages adaptation, yet polices this adaptation's tendency to diffusion. It provides the dis design display with a backbone. This willfulness itself serves as the source of the unit's personality. It derives from the unit's posture and vague anamorphism, as well as the general legibility that derives from the overtness of its mechanical organization. And in conclusion, a little thinking about America. In 1948, after World War II, when America had emerged as the undisputed leader on the world scene, John Kuenhoven wrote a book called Made in America, in which he tried to explain what was so special about American stuff. This is a question that has always interested us because intuitively we've always seen our work as essentially American. We've always considered it to be in contrast to the distinctly European modernism of Foster or Rogers, or in contrast to the general run of historicism that must also look to Europe for its inspiration. Kierdhoven's point of departure was to dispute the common view of America as Europe's clumsy younger sibling, hopelessly imitating its elders' culture with little understanding, admittedly achieving a sort of naive charm, but nothing more. Unlike earlier commentators who had taken culture as the point of reference, Kuenhoven recognized the central role that the machine, that the emerging developing technology, played in forming a uniquely American sensibility. This was the sensibility of, as he put it, the first people in history who, disinherited of a great cultural tradition, found themselves living under democratic institutions in an expanding machine economy. Its cultural successes were based on a, quote, wholehearted acceptance of the industrial and technological environment which was instinctive which, with almost all Americans when they were not consciously struggling in the shadow of an imported culture. He continues, while Europeans learn to use the machine as a middle-aged man learns to drive a car, dubiously and without ceasing to feel that it is alien to his nature, Americans took to it with the enthusiasm of youth and manipulated its levers as if they were the muscles of their own bodies. More recently, Thomas Hines wrote about this same spirit in an article in the New York Times. Looking back with nostalgia toward Kuenhoven's day, as Kuenhoven himself had looked back upon the great Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia in 1876. Hines saw a post-war America animated with the same, quote, easygoing relationship with technology that Kuenhoven described, 
a relationship that bred, as he put it, an improvisational spirit, evidenced not only in music like jazz or art, like Jackson Pollock's action painting or the sculptures of Alexander Calder, but also in architecture and industrial design. In contrast to the tightest styles of the European architects, Americans were engaged in the production of a matter-of-fact modernism that was expressive not of abstract philosophical or moral imperatives, but of the mercantile reality which paid the bills that got the buildings built. America of this period reveled in what he called a humane and innovative materialism that made a clear connection between progress and construction. This was certainly not materialism as we understand it today, exclusively concerned with conspicuous consumption, but a thing orientation more focused on the making of the stuff in the first place and on the bossness of the products that resulted. The comparison between a hot rod and a Ferrari clearly makes the case. Both the hot rod and the Ferrari are highly expressive emanations of their respective cultures. The Ferrari is speed incarnate. Its streamlined form is slightly mysterious. The message it communicates is one of awesome, but sophisticated and svelte power and swiftness. And it does this through giving distinct and direct form to the idea of speed. It looks fast just sitting there. This reinforces the mystery because it stipulates almost a blurring of the details. Where, for example, is the door? The hot rod, on the other hand, is less interested in expressing speed than power, allowing the viewer to make the connection. From the size of the engine so prominently displayed, the result, speed, can be inferred. It is therefore the opposite of mysterious. Its frankness is confused often for a lack of sophistication. Streamlining is neglected as if it were of little consequence next to the 750 horses available to blast through anything so trivial as wind resistance. The artwork which adorns the hot rod, the flames, the pinstriping and performance stickers, the Ferrari shutters, are all as direct in their message as the gleaming power plant, flaring exhaust pipes and fat tires. As obvious and, I think, satisfying as this image is, it is not entirely valid today, however, for both good and bad reasons. Today we are a little more conscious of the adverse environmental effects of such unrestrained exuberance. We might offer up instead as a good example of the unique quality of American stuff today, the high-performance sailing craft which defend the America's Cup. Also today, however, that innocent materialism, which drives expression at both these extremes, is being increasingly replaced by a more worldly, service-oriented consumerism. Today, right now, Ferraris are being built by European architects like Norman Foster or Richard Rogers, while Americans do not seem to be producing hot rods, maybe escorts, maybe even Saturns, but no hot rods. As Thomas Hines explains, this has a dire effect on our easygoing relationship with technology and dilutes the specialness that sets American stuff apart. He says, by the 1950s, the visionaries had dropped out of the marketplace. Goods had become dematerialized. We learned to, atta to become attached not to any particular thing, but to the practice of buying things. General Electric told us that its product was not stoves or steam irons, but progress itself. Features multiplied. The workaday turned stylish. Blenders, for example, offered the meaningless choice between puree and liquefy. This process has continued, he continues, and the more ideals we embrace, the more trash we produce. Like dust falls under the bed, objects proliferate beneath such abstractions as comfort, convenience, progress, or prestige. Our lives fill up with products that few of us can understand, let alone repair. We tend to view technology as a mysterious alien force rather than as the sum of our improvisations, the activity that makes us human. The easy confidence of the immediate post-war world will never be recovered, and the popular modernism that it was expected to produce was probably a little more than wishful thinking in the first place, he concludes. Still, it might be possible, even necessary, to be at ease once again with our artifacts. 
issues that once seemed remote from design, environmental, economic, social, or even technical, may force Americans to take their materialism seriously again. Perhaps in our architecture, at least, we can reaffirm our commitment to and continue to explore the range of what has made America unique. Thank you. And now for any questions. notice I didn't really talk about any project specifically um, uh, and that's just a matter of trying to uh, we find ourselves still in the position of feeling more a need to justify this particular world of reference than its application in a particular project um, we have tried using uh, um, what has recently been called middle tech forums in ways that belie that attitude toward nature that they have in the past become indicative of. For example, on something as mundane as the uh, right array ready mix dispatch building, um, there is a certain amount of uh, steel festooning the uh, face of the dispatching area on that building that is there to make the point about what a direct influence the sun itself has on the dispatcher's activity. In this case, um, uh, there's a lot of technology there uh, the, creating the sunscreens that go up and down on the one side and, and not only go up and down on the other side, but also have a little uh, pair of uh, shades, so to speak, a pair of dark glasses that the dispatcher can look through both to see the trucks and the uh, plant itself. And in other situations and other projects, we've tried to do the same kind of thing, using these forms um, in ways that help to try to make issues of this relationship um, with nature or with the program, with uh, the human activities that the uh, projects are supposed to um, uh, support uh, or celebrate uh, a little bit more visible, but using that same general uh, formalism. Um, it's not very different from anybody else's, really. Um, we, uh, presuming we've got a job, <laughs> we. Uh, we uh, go through uh, uh, somewhat extensive programming uh, process with the client, uh, with uh, the interest in that phase being trying to get the client to see the problem as more than just a set of numbers and a set of square footages to house, but to try to figure out what it is that's unique in that client's particular requirements that we could also use as a uh, a, uh, a guide to making some some nice stuff um, and then we go through <clears throat> and we actually try to stretch this period out for a certain amount of time so that we can begin to simmer and immerse ourselves in whatever it, the culture is that the client is um, trying to um, to uh, house or to build and then we go through like anybody else uh, early sketches um, uh, with the client, trying all the while in the simmering process to come up with some overall uh, uh, big idea, some general generative uh, force that we can hang uh, the particular requirements of the program on. And then just take that through a normal uh, schematics, DD, and working drawing 
process. The only thing that might be unusual, and I suspect it's probably not, is that the design continues throughout that process. It's not like we finish schematics and just hand it over to a production department and then they just build it. But rather, a lot of the, uh, the design continues all the way in through detailing and some changes are made even in the field. And that, of course, makes for some tense situations with the production department. But uh, it's the only way that you can really um, make sure that if you're dealing with uh, what might otherwise be perceived as a mundane middle tech kind of approach, that it doesn't end up being that. And of course, we can argue about whether we've been successful in that, but that's been our intention. What role does the computer play in uh, It sends out billings, and it processes words, and it occasionally does perspectives. And on some projects, very few, it actually does a certain portion of the working drawings. It doesn't do details, but it does do plans and reflected seeing plans, and in some cases, elevation. But uh, we're really, as I suspect many offices are these days, uh, slaved to the one or two individuals in the office who actually know how to speak to the computer. And uh, since our entire office is not computer literate, it has been less useful to us than it might otherwise have been. And this is just a matter of laziness rather than any kind of conviction we have that the computer is evil or that uh, it's not appropriate or anything like that. Someday when they have the systems that are really that the SOMs of the world have, that small offices can have, where we will undoubtedly jump in with both feet. Uh, my is about technology uh, for and I'd like to start a comment on the Where this is coming from is the work of robotics in the last decade where they had to re-establish the cars and the the actual working philosophy of robotics and how you can pumps and cables and things that we have as a palette right now. And so my question is, in your use of technology, are you using a palette of parts that are already out there? And is your firm here to actually develop um, technology to create architectural spaces and uh, parts that are not um, from a we pick the parts or systems or whatever it is that we use precisely for their expressive abilities. A lot of the trends in technology are towards invisibility and a masking of expressiveness, which is exactly counter to what uh, we're after. So for example, for very practical reasons, uh, the, the most up-to-date robots and stuff aren't festooned with the pneumatics and, and, and other cables that its predecessors were. But I think for that reason, at this particular time, suffer a lack of expressiveness. Since what we're trying to do is, is get, engage the user or the viewer to draw them into a kind of a dialogue with the object and one very uh, uh, commonly uh, understood or felt relationship is, is with the, uh, the machine as a sort of what is going on. Um, we're not a very big office, and R&D involves a certain amount of money. We do tend to, to fabricate many of the things that you saw ourselves. Um, and to the extent that that constitutes a sort of R&D, we do advance in our understanding with each project. And we subscribe to the Tomcat, um, which not many architects, I imagine, would, and uh, Design News, and all of the technology uh, um, uh, newsletters. But uh, we just don't have that many opportunities to really test the uh, envelope, so to speak, as much. We do have a lot of stuff up our sleeves that we're waiting for a project to come along that we could try them out on that might be a little bit more um, impressive, you might say, in what they actually do. But I think we're committed uh, for uh, the foreseeable future to doing stuff in a more visible way rather than a less invisible way. Now, we haven't spent much time at all with uh, tension uh, technologies like fabric and that sort of thing. Um, and that's just, that's, almost, that's more of a personal thing than anything else. Um, if you talk about theorizing about the future, 
Is it still going to stay where we can see less pixel crash, or it's more or less the uh, technology is actually designed from the beginning to um, add to the spatial experience, not just sort of the computation? And so then we talk about um, the actual architect work and the science behind it and all that. So you're not using these products to design for the purpose of the world. Yeah, no, I, I wish that were the case, and I think it is the case in certain situations, like you mentioned with Foster or Rogers, who, who get the budgets to be able to do that. And I'm sure if we could command that kind of budget, we would probably be interested in doing that sort of thing ourselves. But um, we are also very interested, unlike I presume they are, in p positioning our work as a vernacular sort of thing. So that in regards to our view of the future, if sort of our physical presence on the earth serves as a limiting factor, as I mentioned in this discussion of the scale at which we dwell, uh, the sort of Newtonian scale at which we dwell, I think we're going to be condemned to a mechanical presence for as long as I can imagine until we can start teleporting and things like this. And so there will be a certain um, respect for physical laws and that sort of thing as is embodied so eloquently in the wide flange or a trussified uh, frame, that sort of thing. And so I think that uh, what, what the story we tell to ourselves is that we're building now a vernacular that could last for some time. Something uh, that uh, you said the last couple of answers has uh, told something that I got from the um, a number of times you referred to works as things, objects, and just going through the show and realizing what I see in the office is work in various magazines and, and finding an external track of it. But all of a sudden I, I start thinking, I don't know if this is criticizing or not. Uh, it's something that seems to work very well externally and and sculpturally. But upon reflection, I realize I've never seen the inside of anything you've done. I've never seen the inside out. And I don't know what, what do you think well, about that? It's probably because we haven't done many projects that had insides. Um, it, and we've gotten a few projects in the office now that will be the first projects that we've had that have insides that would be worth paying attention to. The other ones were, you know, like the batching plant or the uh, film and take archives or insides that are interesting but not necessarily people spaces. I don't see what I'm talking about as being um, particularly uh, constrained to an external appearance. I think that you could take a space like this and imagine it uh, in the way that I've been talking about and begin to understand how the surfaces could be activated. And I don't mean necessarily physically mo movable, but activated in a good old fashioned sense of the term. The ceiling, the uh, balcony could certainly be made more uh, engaging. All these things could occur exactly in the terms, I think, that I've been talking about. Unfortunately, you know, again, there aren't a whole lot of examples of it, but the space is determined by surfaces. The surface can be rethought in a much more active way, um, uh, possibly even a serve and serve kind of relationship. Um, and so, I mean, we're looking forward to it as an opportunity to make that point. Um, again, you're right in saying there aren't very many, if any, examples of it in the slides that I've shown you. But I think that, you know, it's an old, it used to be an old sort of like, like learning the letter in doing working drawings. Once you figured out how to letter so you didn't look like a novice, then you were in. It used to be an old thing in, in um, and probably still is, in architectural education. That there was a point at which you stopped puzzling over the visibility of space and had become so invested in that concept that you began to think that you could, in fact, see space. Whereas any brand new student will, could never understand what you were talking about. I don't see any space. All I see is walls and a ceiling and everything. And I think that that confusion does um, still contain a little bit of truth. That, in fact, what you really do see is the stuff that makes the space. And you can get a feeling of the space, but the stuff that makes the space is what can be subject to design. 
and that's precisely what we think the machine, you know, the whole mechanical analogy can be useful to energizing. Yeah? Uh, same way that the hot rod does, I guess. Um, certainly, uh, Japan has demonstrated an interest in things American, although we don't have any work over there. Um, I would consider Frank Gehry to be uh, absolutely American in that regard. And I think that Europe has also evinced an interest in things America. I mean, look at Euro Disney. Um, hopefully, uh, what I'm proposing might be a little bit more, um, uh, I don't want to say friendly, because obviously Disney, you couldn't get friendlier than that, but a little bit more um, uh, engageable on European terms than uh, that. The only thing I'm trying to do is, is, is say that there was and still continues to have the possibility of being something that is America's contribution to the cultural pool. We shouldn't let that get away, but we shouldn't at the same time uh, assume that that's what everybody should do or should have. I'd be the last person in the world that would want to mess up uh, the Centro Città in Rome with you know, a bunch of uh, office towers or something like that, which are another un fairly unique American um, export. That's how. Well, obviously, I'm sort of overstating the case, um, but I think that that's a lot of what Europe, a lot of how Europe or Japan looks to us is for what you're saying is novelty, what you could otherwise consider to be uniqueness. Um, uh, some things that don't have that flavor uh, might be more you know, specifically scientific uh, exports or something like that, which are fairly international these days. But I don't think that the mere novelty of it uh, makes it you know, inappropriate or devalues it in any way. I mean, novelty just means newness or difference, um, and that's not in itself a negative thing. Maybe when you put it in terms of McDonald's or Disneyland, it might begin to be perceived that way. And I think that there's nobody more cynical about that application in Europe than the Europeans who are importing it. I mean, I don't know what the formula is, but I believe that a lot of people in Europe are making money over that project as well. And uh, uh, so I don't see that as a problem, but that's not how I would see it in America. I mean, I would see it as, uh, you know, a, a re and, I, and I think it would break down within the United States on a regional basis as well. I mean, certainly an application of these ideas in Hawaii would look quite a bit different than they might in Maine or, uh, or North Dakota or something like that, and Florida would be different again. But the point is, is that they're all basically uh, ways of looking um, at nature through the problem and trying to make that evident. Now again, as science has rendered technology as varied as, uh, as it has, so I would imagine that the uh, forms that might be adopted would be as varied. Certainly, if you were trying to uh, take a different uh, way at expressing the statics uh, that are involved in, in building, you're going to end up with much different uh, forms if you were to uh, work on uh, tension structures as opposed to compression structures, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, we would propose, we would suggest that the work of our firm only represents the thinnest segment of possibility within that general attitude. Uh, 
think anybody knows it's there. I think in the general run of things, uh, suspended ceiling isn't, isn't masking something in that way. Uh, I think it's just avoiding the problem. Uh, you know, again, there's always a delicate question if it's viewed as an imposition. I mean, if you're forcing people to live in a, in a technologically intensive environment, right, do you need to, to, to stick it in their face all the time? I think that the answer to that is, is basically uh, is you're not is is kind of halfway uh, between the talent of the people who are doing it um, and the education of the people who are viewing it. Um, so that, and I don't think there are any hard and fast rules. Certainly, in in a certain situation, you might want to have a very uncluttered environment, say. Um, for for uh, increasing concentration or something like that, but I think that the way that that has gone about nowadays is just out of uh, habit and ignorance rather than any intention to um, hide stuff. Now, part of the problem we face today in the United States that, that that is less of a problem in Europe is that we are slaves to the standards of the building trades, the conventions and systems that are available to us economically, none of which. Uh, is assumed to be visible, all of which is assumed that it doesn't have to take its appearance into account because it will be hidden. Um, when you want to expose ductwork, you incur a premium, not because the stuff is necessarily any different, but because the uh, contractor can be as sloppy in putting it together as he might otherwise be. Um, and that is a problem, and, and what we're suggesting definitely goes against the grain of that. Now, in Europe, where they have fewer over its systems to, to do, and there's a lot of uh, one-offmanship occurring in the at least the higher profile buildings, it's not as big an issue. And then the stuff can be made worthy of uh, inspection, made, made worthy in a way that's not necessarily insistent, but also not uh, disingenuously hidden. But it's there, and it's part of the same. Um, well, well, one way to think about it is that one of the things we find so attractive about classicism as opposed to, say, the, uh, the worst uh, of, of modernism is the visual interest in activity, the detail that's available, all that sort of thing. Um, and certainly what we're talking about here is a way of re reintroducing that level of detail and interest and visual elaboration and shade and shadow into a project. And if it's done well with those ideas in mind, rather than just as a technological smorgasbord or a, an educational, you know, uh, you know, here is the mechanical system and here's the plumbing and this sort of thing, but the disposition of those things is actually taken into account, then there's no reason why that stuff couldn't serve the same function in a building today that the architraves and, and um, and <clears throat> pilasters and that sort of stuff, even on the inter uh, function during the classical period, uh, when people were were uh, up on that and expected it. I, I think they 
uh, represents something quite a bit different in a great danger to architecture, actually, because that technology is all about dematerialization and disembodiment and um, the, the uh, devaluation of things present. And I think that as we continue to maintain corporeal bodies and engage the world, you know, in physical terms, that we're going to continue to need environments which support that and don't um, uh, diminish the uh, uh, importance of that. And so I think that there will be a uh, probably an incredible fascination with this stuff, and all sorts of people will be trying to figure out how you can get that into architecture. How can you make architecture take more account of the computer and everything else? But the problem is, is, is to the extent architecture continues to shelter and we haven't invented some kind of force field system or something like that, there will always have to be a thing there. And you can make that thing be covered with video screens and that sort of thing so it's, it's changeable or whatever else. But I think, and I think that there will be a, a brief interest in that on an incredible scale and then it will sort of simmer down to being yet another tool at the architect's disposal. But I don't think it's, it's finally going to be an answer that's, that's going to change radically what we really understand as architecture and architecture's responsibility for another you know, three or four hundred years until we do have things like force fields or something that can really radically contest the need for shelter, physical shelter. Um, the tract house, um, that is a house that's very specifically attempting to be a critique of the prevalent trends in Southern California suburban housing, um, which are um, the dislocation of the house from anything other than its garage and driveway and the, you know, the connection of everything via the car, the um, trend to maximize the collage, what we call a collage of features or amenities within an envelope that is uh, basically maxes out the, the allowable building area on the site. So you end up with these massive two-story shoebox pigs, we call them, you know, with a little bit of Tudor applique on the front and a in a hot tub and cathedral ceilings and river rock and all this kind of junk and 15 bedrooms and 27 baths which are way beyond what the uh, whole American dream as realized in the uh, suburban ideal uh, was originally. And this is trying to say that um, you can enhance the quality of life, you can have more contact with your yard, you can have more uh, valuable experiences and still maintain whatever amenities and features you want in a much less space just by distributing it more differently on the yard and making um, the space uh, that you do have serve double duty with the yard so that some of the spaces are inside, outside space. Sort of, it's almost a re, re um, uh, introduction of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's Usonian ideals uh, of you know the flow of inside to outside space, the hearth, the center, the working uh, guts of the house, um, and trying to make all of those active uh, conditions of dwelling. The house is uh, uh, eminently tunable in response to the environment and in response to the seasons, unlike the uh, air-conditioned uh, uh, monsters that are, are, are being built now that leave so little yard left, there's no point in going out there. And, and anyway, that's basically what the point of that exercise was. And it stands in the office now as a kind of someday we're going we're gonna to get to build it. Um, but we have to wait for the economy to get, get moving again. Where does he resolve that? 
Well, it's interesting you should ask that. We actually tell a story about try, trying to to locate what we would consider to be our patrimony or matrimony or whatever. Um, we tell a story uh, about Corbu being visited by aliens um, at the point um, before he first does the first Citroen house. And um, basically the point is is that the aliens are really concerned because the humans are like getting really technologically advanced way too fast for them to be populating the universe. And the aliens visit the Earth and they try to figure out how they can throw a few roadblocks in man's uh, uh, way so he doesn't get out in the universe too quickly before he's become sophisticated enough to make use of, of his technology in a, in a responsible way. And so what they do is, I mean, we say, um, actually this story is less valid nowadays, but they visit Lenin and they visit Corbu in, seven, in 1917, and they get Lenin to throw a revolution to basically tie up the, uh, uh, the economy of the industrialized nations for, I guess it's been 60 or 70 years now, 80 years maybe. Um, and then they visit Corbu, and what they talk to Corbu about is, um, they try to steer him on the, see, Corbus now has this nascent idea of the machine as being important for architecture and technology being, you know, where, again, how we should, uh, uh, what should be the new sort of uh, appearance of architecture. And what the aliens tell Corbu is that, yeah, that's really neat. The technology you're interested in is the technology of airplanes and steamships, which is a technology of abstraction and um, <coughs> streamlining. And, that the, and, and the technology of mass production, what you want to react to in the 19th century is the, cu is the custom fabrication, the uh, uniqueness of each individual thing. And you really want to push this mass production side of things and everything. And of course, what the effect of that is, is to create a uh, modern architecture that's highly abstract, highly impersonal, highly international, and highly uh, mass production oriented, which completely alienates most people from it. And that puts a stumbling block in the progress of humanities uh, uh, coming to embrace on a one-to-one -one and comfortable level its technology, which is the step that must be taken before we can get into the stars, get to the stars where each of us individually has an absolutely friendly and normal relationship with the inside of our car, et cetera, et cetera. What they did was, was at, at, at the place where the fork occurred, they sent us off into abstraction, which would, which would put cast technology in an alien and mysterious role. And we would like to say that the other fork you could take is to continue the evolution that had begun actually in the 19th century before the systemization had occurred. And there was a lot of one-off, uh, more craftsman-oriented relationships to technology. And we'd like to say that, you know, if possible, we would go back to that point and say, you know, unlike the other difference between the hot rod and the Ferrari is, is that even though the Ferrari has a limited production run, it still is very much a, 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 a um, factory produced vehicle, whereas the hot rod is something you do in your garage and it's, each one is individual and each one begins to make the connection between the driver or the author or the critic and the object that is so constituted um, and stands in that absolutely as a criticism of the alienness of technology that we have nowadays, which is due, we would say, almost entirely to the systemization, the universalization, the, the mindsets of mass production, which value abstraction over individuality, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where we would like to see place our, our own minds. Okay, well, thank you.